All right. Good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for joining another Wu University event. This is the part one of our three part series and super excited for my good friend, Dr. B Melissa Barnett to kick things off. I am your host, Dr. Stephanie Wu, and I am the founder of Wu University. I do want to say thank you so much to Glaucos for supporting this event with an unrestricted educational grant. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our amazing speaker for tonight, Dr. Melissa Barnett. Dr. Barnett is a principal optometrist at the University of California, Davis. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of ABO, a fellow and global ambassador of the BCLA, and serves on the board of the AOA contact lens and cornea section. She's also a board member of the GPLI and the International Society of Contact Lens Specialists. She's also a past president of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Something that I'm really proud of Dr. Barnett for is her amazing book. She and Dr. Lynette Johns authored and edited the book, Contemporary Scleral Lenses. Anybody listening in that has questions about scleral lenses, I highly recommend this book. You will, you'll absolutely love it. And Dr. Barnett was granted the most influential women in optical from Vision Monday in 2019. On, on top of Dr. Barnett being one of the most world-renowned speakers and highly requested speakers across the entire globe, uh, Dr. Barnett is a dear friend of mine and, a, and just a wonderful person. So it's just a delight to have her on this evening. And just so we can get to know Dr. Barnett a little bit more, we just have a quick poll and uh, she's gonna actually tell us the answer to this question at uh, toward the end of the presentation. So which of the following is true about Dr. Barnett? She won first place as a, at a bodybuilding competition in 2007. She was on the high school high jump team and could jump over five feet. She can speak Cantonese and conversational Mandarin. She donated 13 inches of hair to Wigs for Kids in 2001. She has two dogs, four cats, one guinea pig, and one goldfish. So just a couple more seconds for anybody to vote. I always love to see what people think is, is the truth. And uh, it's always exciting for the speaker to kind of let us know what the actual truth is uh, in this presentation. All right, so most people think that uh, Dr. Barnett donated 13 inches of hair to wigs for kids. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Barnett, for, for joining us today and uh, take it away. Oh, well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And it's always a pleasure to lecture here for Wu Yu and so proud of you, my good friend, too. So I will, I will answer this uh, towards the end, the correct answer, but I do have two kids and a husband who's an optometrist, so I don't have any pets at all. So just, to, but thank you for thinking that I had lots of pets. I do wanna share a little bit about where I practice. As many of you know, I practice at UC Davis. However, I practice at three distinct locations for UC Davis. So one is in Sacramento, where I do all the specialty contact lens and scleral lens work and dry eye and do research on Sjogren's. The other is a general disease-based practice. And then the third is on campus at UC Davis, where I'm seeing students. And students are of college age can be really any age, but the majority are in their late teens and early 20s or 30s those in graduate school, it's a large international population as well. So this lecture is kind of interesting and important to me personally because keratoconus is so highly prevalent and I hope to share that with you tonight. And keratoconus can be diagnosed in any sort of practice situation. So when I'm working at this location on campus with students, I don't have my fancy tools that I have at the other two locations. I find that having a pentacam is just wonderful. I can image the anterior and the posterior cornea. I can get global pachymetry. I feel like it's sometimes magical how much information I can get. 
But at this other location, I have a, ge it's a general practice. I have a slot lamp. I have the regular tools. I, of course, a ferropter. I do have a keratometer and I do have an auto keratometer and a retina scope. So that's a little bit of a hint of what we're going to talk about tonight. So the definition of keratoconus, as we know, so according in 2015, keratoconus has an abnormal posterior ectasia, an abnormal corneal thickness distribution, and the clinically non-inflammatory corneal thinning. So as I mentioned, imaging the posterior cornea is really helpful. However, sometimes we can't do that. So what do we actually do? So if you do have topography in your practice, that's extremely helpful. We can look for areas of elevation. We can look for different, we can look at the different SIM case. We can look centrally. We can look peripherally. We can look all over the cornea to see what exactly is going on with the cornea. Now, if the corneal curvature is more than 48 diopters, then we get concerned. And I guess in, when I'm thinking about keratoconus in my practice and in every single practice, I'm always thinking about ruling out keratoconus. And I would like you to do the same. Just as when we see kids in our practice, we wanna rule out myopia because of the diseases associated with myopia. But in my practice, I see so many patients on a day-to-day -day basis with keratoconus at the other locations that even when I'm at the student location, I'm always thinking about keratoconus. And I'm gonna give you some tools that, that are gonna help you think about keratoconus as well. Of course, if you have in your practice OCT, we can measure uh, corneal thickness, specifically epithelial thickness with OCT. As I mentioned, I do have corneal tomography at two of the locations. And it's really nice if we do have this advanced instrumentation, but you don't actually need all of it or, or even one or two pieces of it to diagnose keratoconus. Now, keratoconus is in the news lately. As you can see at the bottom picture here, Steph Curry had issues with his eyes. And no, I don't see Steph Curry as a patient. We are pretty close. You know, he's only an hour or two away from me. But he really brought keratoconus to the forefront. And at the bottom picture here, you can see an image of our, our good friend, Ed Bennett, with Tommy Fan, who also has keratoconus. And I think it's wonderful that you get these high profile people talking about this condition that is really much more prevalent than we ever thought before. In fact, you, and I'm gonna go over some studies in a moment, but one out of five people with keratoconus needed a corneal transplant. Now this is back in 1998 and things have really changed since then and I'll share that with you. And also we'll look at different studies about the prevalence and how that changes in different ethnicities and locations and regions and different studies. But in my practice, I can see 12 patients in a morning with keratoconus. So in my practice, I think it's very highly prevalent. Of course, we know that family history is really important. So I'm always asking my patients if they do have a family history of keratoconus. So how common is keratoconus? And just think about that, like in your practice, how many patients do you see on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis with keratoconus? And now years ago, there was a study done many years ago, and it really depends on the type of study and where the study is being done and how the study is done. But one out of 2000 people were diagnosed with keratoconus. Then it was one in 375 and then one in 84. But let's look at these studies here in more specific detail. So here going back to 1986. So this was a study done in Minnesota and diagnosis was done on the detection of scissors reflex with retinoscopy and keratometry outcomes. Now you might think, and I hope if you haven't picked up your retina scope in maybe a day or two, that you pick it up and use it tomorrow. And just, you know, 
get, and this is really for the maybe newer practitioners out there or those that just don't do a lot of retinoscopy. I love retinoscopy. I think that retinoscopy is so incredibly helpful to, for all sorts of things, right? One, we can look for a scissors reflex when we're looking for keratoconus. For those who cannot respond and we just want the testing to be completely objective, whether it's a child or an older patient with dementia, it's super helpful to have retinoscopy. And when fitting contact lenses, specifically scleral lenses, it's so nice to have retinoscopy as a starting point. Just do a quick ret, get a starting point, and move on from there. Let's look at some of the other studies as well. So I'm going to kind of go to that 2014 study by Hashemi. This was in Iran. 2.5% of patients were diagnosed with keratoconus. Now let's go down here to Chan study in 2020 in Australia, and 1.2% or 1 in 84 were diagnosed with keratoconus. So that's you know, a little bit different and much higher, of course, than before. Now, there are some studies currently going on, especially in children, looking, just screening studies, looking at all children for keratoconus. And I'm so excited to see the results of those that are not quite published to see what the true prevalence of keratoconus is. Now, if you go down to the last part here, so Hashemi in 2020, looked at a meta-analysis of keratoconus and found that it's about one in 700. So if you're not seeing keratoconus on say a weekly basis, I would really encourage you to look at all of these findings that I'm gonna share with you shortly because I think you're gonna pick up keratoconus much more than you did before. Now, if you do have corneal topography, you can image the ocular surface. So here you can see a normal cornea. You can see that form for us sort of keratoconus. And I always like to counsel my patients, even with form for us keratoconus, not to do any corneal refractive surgery like LASIK uh, for the risk of ectasia. And we see a lot of corneal ectasia in our practice, especially in that sort of appearance. We can have a nipple cone, we can have an oval cone, we can have a globus cone. There are many different types of keratoconus. And I like to share the imaging with my patients. And if you have it, I would encourage you to do so. And really to explain how their cornea looks, explain the anterior surface, explain the posterior surface. And that really helps me when I'm talking about different treatment options and different management options, and also why glasses are not going to do the trick because of all the irregular astigmatism. Also, on a kind of a side note, but important when we're talking about keratoconus, it is really important to do a refraction to determine the best corrected vision. Because if a patient has pretty decent best corrected vision with glasses, you could consider glasses, conventional soft lenses, corneal gas permeable lenses, hybrid lenses say, you don't need to necessarily move on to highly specialized lenses. However, if a patient has really reduced vision, best corrective vision with glasses, then I move on to all the specialty contact lenses and I know in my head, wow, they're really gonna be impressed even if they have like 20, 20 minus two vision versus if they have, you know, 20, 40 vision or something like that. So there are many conditions associated with keratoconus. So if you're in a practice without all the fancy tools, you can on your health history form, when you're asking patients questions, I find that these are really, really helpful. So I like to ask, number one is probably eye rubbing. And that's the vigorous eye rubbing. So that's not just the touching, tapping, that's the grinding with the knuckles. And I do have some photos coming right up. We know that allergies and allergic rhinitis are associated with keratoconus. I live in Northern California. I live specifically in Davis. It's like allergy central of the country. Although don't we all say that, but really all my patients have allergies. But it's the allergies, the severe allergies, the allergies that are really driving patients crazy that we want to ask for when we're 
looking for keratoconus. Asthma, really common. Any sort of atopy or atopic dermatitis. And many patients will come in and they will already be diagnosed with these other conditions. So just asking them, you know, what they have is really helpful when we're searching for keratoconus. Now I'm going to go into sleep apnea in, in a little bit here. We know that diabetes is another condition and Down syndrome. So this adorable little eight-year-old is my friend's daughter who is diagnosed with Down syndrome. So my poor friend, I'm constantly saying, okay, has she had her eye exam? You know, has she checked? And so far she's not diagnosed with keratoconus, but it was a good excuse to throw her in because she's so cute. Now, there have been multiple studies on sleep apnea and keratoconus. So a, a meta-analysis was done in OBS. This was a review from 2012 to 2016 and looked at many patients with keratoconus and also a control group. And in this study, those who had keratoconus were 1.8 times more likely to have sleep apnea than the general population. I find this to be very true with my patients and especially those with keratoconus kind of have that floppy eyelid. So if you just pull up the eyelid with your thumb, you can look for keratoconus that way. And again, just a standard split lamp examination. Now in this study, sleep apnea is around 9% in patients with keratoconus. And we know that the risk of death and also stroke is one and a half to two times higher in those with keratoconus and sleep apnea than those without sleep apnea. And a CPAP machine is very helpful. So I do like to ask my patients if they have a CPAP machine, and if so, if they're using it, because some it's adjustment or they're not using it or they're not comfortable. And then I encourage them to go back to whoever prescribed it to get it adjusted so they can use it and they can wear it to really prevent the risk of stroke and death as well. And the study showed that the CPAP does help improve quality of life. Now, this is a different interesting study looking at high drops and mitral valve prolapse. So high drops occurs in about 5% of patients with keratoconus. And the prevalence of mitral valve prolapse in patients with corneal high drops due to keratoconus is 65%. So kind of interesting. Now, just a review of mitral valve prolapse because it might have been a while. It occurs when the valve between the heart's left atrium and left ventricle don't close properly. And then the valve bulges or prolapses upwards or back into the atrium. And the prevalence is about two to 3% and treatment may or may not be indicated. However, it is something to look out for or if a patient has already been diagnosed then we want to look out for keratoconus. Now the prevalence and risk factors for keratoconus globally. So this was yet another study, a meta-analysis looking at 29 articles in 15 different countries. And in this study, the prevalence of keratoconus in the general population was 1.38 per thousand. And the sex prevalence, and I'm smiling because I'm gonna share a story with you, Men was 20.6 and women 18.33 per thousand. I, so years ago, I had a patient and we all got a good laugh. So he came in, he was seen in Southern California, had a few different procedures done and then was going to school. So I actually saw him at the student population. And he told me, oh, women don't get keratoconus. I said, really? Women don't get keratoconus at all? How do you know this? And he said, oh, yeah. So when I went and then they told me, I think it was just something he read or whatever. So I shared that with one of the corneal specialists I work with and we got a chuckle. So it is really true. I said, no, no, that's, <laughs> that's incorrect. Both men and women. And I have many patients who are female who have keratoconus. So we all laughed about that. So we still need to continue educating. I think that's the take home from that story. So looking at another study about the prevalence and risk factors for keratoconus, so eye rubbing is a huge one. 
But look at this, family history. Family history is gigantic. And that's why I ask every single patient who had, if they have a family history of keratoconus, especially if they have risk factors. Now my patients who have keratoconus, I'm very excited to share with them a new genetic test for keratoconus that can be done even in children, even in young children. It's a very easy cheek swab that can be done to diagnose the risk score for keratoconus and corneal dystrophies. Allergies up there, asthma and eczema, and these are all risk factors for keratoconus. Now let's talk about eye rubbing because eye rubbing is so huge. And I'm sure many of you have been in the exam room, you've seen the patient in the chair and you've seen them like physically rubbing their eyes. Now we don't want any of our patients to rub their eyes, even those with allergies not associated with keratoconus, but that really severe eye rubbing is associated with keratoconus. So in another study, eye rubbing, that vigorous eye rubbing was present in 83% of patients compared to 58% of controls. So one thing that's really important for us in practice when we're seeing our patients with keratoconus is to manage this so they don't feel the need to rub their eyes. So simply prescribing a mast cell stabilizer antihistamine eye drop, a steroid eye drop as needed, and of course monitoring the patient. Uh, talking about cool compresses, using a cool compress and not necessarily warm when it's itch. Also refrigerating drops, so using preservative-free, say artificial tears, or that mast cell stabilizer antihistamine, putting it in the refrigerator is really soothing so that the patients don't rub. Now, of course, sometimes the eye rubbing is done maybe during sleep or other times, but during the daytime, having just simple methods to control it are really important. Now, ethnicities and keratoconus are also quite interesting. So in a study by Rabinowitz looking at keratoconus in the Western populations, it was 0.5 to say 2.3. And then a, a different study actually looking at Jews living in Israel, in Jerusalem specifically, it was 10 times more common. And then in another study, three times more common, keratoconus is three times more common in the non-FARS Iranian ethnic groups than the FARS population. So really does vary. And when I talk to practitioners from around the world, it's so incredibly interesting. In some of the warmer climates around the world, the prevalence of keratoconus seems to be so much higher through the roof versus some of the cooler climates in other parts of the world. And that's why looking at the studies, we need to look exactly where the study was done, what is the ethnicity, of the population in that study. And those of us in practice who work with many different populations, we tend to notice sort of groups of patients with different ethnicities that have keratoconus. Of course, keratoconus can be prevalent in every ethnicity, I should state that too. So we're learning so much more about the genetic component of keratoconus, which is why the new genetic testing is so exciting. And we know that there are many genetic factors. Now, patients are asking about this all the time. So I have patients who come in, I have young patients, I have older patients, and they're all very concerned about keratoconus. I would especially say those who are parents of young children, they're really worried. I'll give you an example. A 44-year-old patient, she is young to have had a corneal transplant in one eye done 20 years ago. In her other eye, she has not had a corneal transplant and hopefully we won't need to go there. And she has a nine-year-old daughter. So she is asking me, well, what can I do for my daughter so that she doesn't have to go through all that I've been through? And I do have some quality of life studies here at the end, which I'll share with you. But we know that keratoconus really impacts the quality of life. And so that's why we want to prevent as much as possible so the patients don't need a corneal transplant and don't need to go there. 
there is an autosomal dominant component to in keratoconus and we do need to definitely screen all family members. I tell my patients that we have to screen their entire family. And by that, I mean cousins and relatives and everyone, but then we can stress the importance of an eye exam, which is great to stress also because we can find more than 260 diseases in the eye, and but especially important to screen those who have a history of keratoconus. Now, let's talk about kids and keratoconus because when we see children, the disease tends to progress more rapidly and be more aggressive than in adults. And in my practice, gosh, I can think of some very young children, um, seven, eight years old, with very severe keratoconus. So in these patients, we really, really want to manage keratoconus as early as possible to prevent the need for a corneal transplant. Now, fun fact here, a study that showed that smoking actually reduced the prevalence of keratoconus. I am not recommending at all that you recommend to your patients to start smoking. I'm just telling you this study. And another study said that diabetes actually reduces the risk. Again, not recommending that you have your patients eat lots of sugary food to become diabetic or anything like that. And diabetic patients with keratoconus have less severe disease, which I would encourage you to look for, although the previous study said the opposite. So the studies all don't say the same thing. So risk factors for keratoconus age, of course. So younger children, the disease is more aggressive. Genetics, we know that's extremely huge and family history. So even if you don't have fancy instruments, you can ask, <laughs> you will know the age, you'll ask about the family history. And I encourage my patients to even tell me later about the family history, because sometimes I'll ask them, do you have a family history of keratoconus or corneal atasia? And they'll say, I've never heard that word before. I have no idea what you're talking about. And then if I see them next time where they can always send a message, then they say, oh yeah, I asked. And my sister has what you said, keratoconus. And so then we have that conversation. So you can always add that in later. So we know that the vigorous eye rubbing really has a relationship with keratoconus. Floppy eyelid syndrome, remember to flip that upper lid to look for floppy eyelid syndrome. And let's also talk about pregnancy. Fun fact here too, when we're looking at uh, comorbidities in keratoconus, so Marfan syndrome, I learned that Abe Lincoln uh, actually diagnosed with Marfan's. We talked about Down syndrome and we'll kind of move on because I think that pregnancy is very important. So we have many female patients who do have keratoconus and there have been many studies on pregnancy and keratoconus. So there is a change in these studies due to pregnancy, due to the hormones, estrogen and relaxin, and it alters the biomechanical properties of the cornea to increase the refractive power. So let's dive into just one study here. So this looked at 22 patients with bilateral keratoconus, 11 intended to become pregnant and 11 did not. And it compared refraction and topography before pregnancy during the third trimester in six months after giving birth, 100% of eyes in the pregnancy group experienced significant progression of keratoconus and none of the control eyes demonstrated any progression. Now of utmost importance is that there was no evidence of reversal after pregnancy and there was no long-term follow-up data in this study. So what can we do when we're talking to our patients? One, I think it's important to counsel our patients, especially females of childbearing age. And now that we have management options like cross-linking, we can encourage that. If a patient is planning on getting pregnant, we can offer them cross-linking prior to becoming pregnant to prevent future progression. So I think it's really important. I, I don't think we talk about this a whole lot, 
But we see it time and time again, where women who've gone gotten pregnant and then after pregnancy, there's a huge change. Again, we want to preserve vision and we want to prevent progression as much as we can. So I sort of mentioned all the fancy tools that you can do when we're looking for keratoconus. So we can use corneal topography, tomography, epithelial thickness on OCT. But what if you don't have those tools? What can you do? So symptoms, right? Patient symptoms, so incredibly important. What about the patient that comes in? I love this because we see this all the time. They've had just a lot of different glasses prescriptions over the last few years. They come in, vision's not clear, it's you know kind of blurry, and then you notice maybe a pattern with that. There, there's an increase in astigmatism, there's an increase in myopia. But these patients come in and you show them the 2020 line and they say, no, it's not clear. So it might not be as blurry as that picture here on the upper right, but it's just not clear enough. It's not good enough now due to the higher order aberration. So they might say that their vision looks like it's shadows or it's blurry or their halos around the letters, or it's just not as clear as they want it to be. And that's a question that I like to ask my patients. So when I'm refracting them, I show them both eyes, binocular vision, and I ask them, how does it look? And I document if it looks clear or if it looks blurry. I find that this is really helpful when fitting specialty contact lenses. So I know what patient expectations are for vision with the contact lenses. Now we're looking for shifts and refraction. So an increase in astigmatism is huge. Asymmetry between the two eyes is huge. So sometimes there's a change, maybe even just a quarter or a half a diopter in one eye and not in the other eye. It could be an increase in myopia and astigmatism that you could also notice a skewed radial axis of that astigmatism. And I'm saying this is just with refraction, just with keratometry or autokeratometry. Now, checking keratometry is really helpful. And at that student location, we have an autokeratometer. So I had a patient yesterday, she came in, her Ks were 49 diopters. I said, 49 diopters, new patient, never seen her before. So I actually physically walked her over and I did the auto K again and checked to see the quality of those Myers. And there was a regularity on one eye, the right eye, a little bit more than the left eye. And so I would send her for, for more work because we don't have it at that location. But I actually like to see the Myers myself. And you could do that with manual or automated keratometry to see if there is any irregularity of the Myers. An increase in astigmatism is important and myopia. And also those patients who are changing their contact lenses, not just their glasses often. So here you can see some images of irregular Myers when we're looking at them. If you're checking, I would encourage you to check keratometry. If it's a steep K over 47, 48, you should be thinking about keratoconus. And also if those Myers are blurry or distorted, then it's, it is important. Now I'm talking about early keratoconus here, not advanced keratoconus where you can't even get a reading. By that time you're seeing corneal findings and it's pretty obvious that they do have keratoconus. What I'm referring to is the non-clinical keratoconus. Now, if you learn one thing from the lecture, this is the slide, this is the study that I want you to take home with you to put into practice tomorrow. So this was a study that looked at retinoscopy. So it looked at the validity and reliability of retinoscopy compared to the gold standard or the Pentacam. This study was done in 10 to 30 year old patients. There were 123 patients and those who were referred to the clinic with multiple different diagnoses, such as keratoconus, a suspect for keratoconus, reduced vision, eye discomfort, frequent changes of glasses, refraction, or even refractive surgery was in there as well. So retinoscopy was done to determine the scissoring reflex. And I would encourage you to do that. So just do a quick rep, look at the quality of the light, if it's bright, if it's not, if there's a scissors reflex there. 
and then the results of retinoscopy and Pentacam were compared. So in this study, retinoscopy had a sensitivity of over 97% and a specificity of about 80%. That is huge. So therefore, retinoscopy appears to be very sensitive and reliable test that you can use in your clinic to check for keratoconus. Now, you can see this image here. This is kind of a fun one, and this shows an image of retinoscopy over a scleral lens, but you can also appreciate the scissoring reflex, uh, thanks to Lynette Johns for that image. So we talked about all the symptoms that patients might complain of, and I would encourage you to just ask your patients how they feel their quality of vision is, regardless of what finding you get. Now, checking pachymetry is something that's also helpful. So if we have a tool like a Pentacam with global pachymetry, then we can get a very detailed analysis. But say we don't have that, say we just have a handheld pachymeter like the one we have up here. You can check and see if their central pachymetry is less than 500. Now, the there is a there is this is my this is my thing here. So the A B C D grading system is defined as looking at the anterior and posterior corneal curvatures, the thinnest pachymetry, distance vision, and it has five different stages. But I'd like to propose uh, to all of you tonight to think about this. If you don't have all the fancy tools that you could do your own modified ABCD grading system. So say you can check corneal thickness, maybe even just centrally. So if it's less than say 534, then you could be concerned for keratoconus. You can check the vision. And if the vision is reduced or just sy symptomatically, subjectively, it's not as clear as the patient wants it to be. If you're looking for retinoscopy, I'm throwing that in there, and you're seeing some scissoring reflex, and then just looking at keratometry or autokeratometry and looking for steep K, and also looking for irregular Myers. So there is a way to do this without all of the advanced instrumentation. Now, we all know the clinical signs of keratoconus and what I would like you to do, all of us, is to diagnose before we get to the signs. Of course, we have Munson sign there. Looking down, you see that V-shaped conformation. I don't want to get to the point of corneal scarring, as you can see bottom right. I really don't want to get to any of these points of thinning or high drops or anything at all, because it is important to manage keratoconus prior to these findings. So we know family history is very important and we know the genetic factor is very important and all of the other conditions that are associated for keratoconus are also important. Allergies, atopy, other systemic conditions and sleep apnea included there as well. But there's been a lot of research into the genetic component of keratoconus, and there are many different genes that have been identified. So here is a study that looked at the correlation of, of keratoconus with Elhurst-Danlos syndrome genes, and this was actually a recent study, study that was done that showed the correlation and demonstrated that there is a shared genetic etiology between the two. But I would like to share with you, and I don't expect you to read this at all, but all of the many different studies, and these are new, there's a lot of great new information about the genetics of keratoconus, and there is indeed genetic evidence implicating more than two dozen genes that are susceptible for keratoconus. So that's why genetic testing is so exciting. But of course, we wanna prevent, if possible, we want to prevent the condition from progressing. And we do now have corneal collagen cross-linking that has been revolutionary. So cross-linking was approved in the US in 2016, and it really helps avoid the need for a corneal transplant, reduces the economic burden, and I would add in there, improves the quality of life as well.
So prior to cross-linking being approved in the US, of course, it was done around the world for many, many years prior to US approval. But the old mantra was diagnosing and then monitoring. There wasn't a lot we could do. We could prescribe maybe some specialty contact lenses and then have a corneal transplant. But the new mantra is really to diagnose early to stop progression with cross-linking and then rehabilitate vision with all sorts of things. So cross-linking approved in 2016, completely revolutionary in the treatment. And there have been multiple studies, I would say multiple studies even outside of the US. And then of course, multiple studies within the US showing the benefits of cross-linking. It is a safe and effective procedure to halt ectatic progression. So here you can actually see, and I like to explain to my patients that cross-linking is using riboflavin and, and using um, with, with the B12 and with the light, so actually using the KXL ultraviolet light delivery system to stop progression and to cross-link those corneal fibrils. Now, I also like to explain to my patients that cross-linking is not a refractive procedure. So this is not going to eliminate the need for glasses or contact lenses. And it, in our practice, it is a procedure that is done within the practice uh, in, a, in a separate room. So it's actually done at the same location. So here you can see the UV light and the vitamin B2 and how it makes the cornea stronger. And my goal for all of my patients is really to prevent progression, to preserve vision so that my patients don't need a corneal transplant. Now, years ago, we had a lot of troubles with coverage for cross-linking. So it was tough. I knew that cross-linking was really the right thing for my patients. It's what I wanted them to do, but we had a lot of difficulty getting coverage. But fortunately now, and this is pretty recent news in the last few years, coverage is so much better than it was before. So 96% of commercial lives are covered and there are resources at the Living with KC website for coverage. But I had a different patient yesterday who came in and he's in graduate school and I have been, I've seen him for many years and we talked about cross-linking years ago, but he just couldn't afford it at that time. And I sent him again yesterday for another consultation for cross-linking because I told him the coverage is so much better now. And I also made sure that he's around so we can do this for him before he goes off into the world. And fortunately he is around for another few months. So we'll get him cross-linked and I'll see him back, fit him with his scleral lenses and he'll do really well. But I hope that he can get cross-linking at this stage in his life now that he will prevent progression and it, it's looking good. So really briefly, just going over why we don't want to rush to a corneal transplant in our patients with keratoconus. There are so many other options. We have cross-linking, we have specialty contact lenses, but we do have different types of corneal transplants that can be done now more specific for the corneal layers, but there are many risks associated with transplants and we do need to educate our patients appropriately. So if they have a transplant, it's not just a one and done sort of thing and endothelial cells tend to decrease over time and there are risks associated with it, including uh, rejection of the corneal transplant. We wanna be extra concerned if there is neovascularization, if there's a history of herpetic disease, and we can have patients who come in during their lifetime with episodes of rejection. We see this very commonly. And so if possible, it'd be great not to have a corneal transplant and not to have a repeat need for a corneal transplant. It is important to educate our patients that if they have any urgent symptoms like redness or photophobia or pain or decreased vision to call right away. Sometimes they have hyposthesia and can't feel their cornea. And so even if they look into the mirror and say that their eyes red or someone else looks at their eye and says it's red, they do need to come in right away. But hopefully that will 
I, I want to stress the importance of early cross-linking and just, you know, where the question that often comes up is like, so where does that fit in uh, to your conversation? Because many patients are referred to me for specialty contact lenses. And when do I talk about cross-linking? I actually talk to them about cross-linking first. I think it's important to diagnose keratoconus really early so that we can cross-link early, so that we can prevent any sort of progression, thus avoiding a corneal transplant. So that cross-linking conversation can be long, it can be lengthy, it's oftentimes with a parent as well, or it's done with the patient and then the parent. But I think that, that having that long conversation is important to see where they are, where the patient, if they feel comfortable with this, even if they feel comfortable going in for a consultation, that's a great option so that it can help prevent any sort of progression. Now, sometimes it takes a few visits of having this conversation. There are resources about cross-linking to share with patients, which is also quite helpful. But let's talk about the economic impact of keratoconus because it is quite significant. So this was looking at a study. It included all the costs of visits and fitting fees and contact lenses and surgery and complications. And this study showed that there is a significant cost, a burden of keratoconus, and even more so than myopia of more than $25,000. Now there's also the need for a corneal transplant or an additional transplant or a regraft. And so this economic impact really does affect the quality of life due to the relatively young onset of the disease. So it is a significant public health concern. Another good reason to, for early intervention with cross-linking. This was uh, from the National Keratoconus Foundation that shared that 46% of patients pay more than $1,000 annually for treatment costs. And just think about it. Your patient's wearing, say, scleral lenses. They might not have coverage for things like solutions, application solution, disinfection solution, plungers, different devices to put on lenses. And this, this can really add up. Now, I do want to highlight just a few studies on the quality of life and keratoconus because I think it's really important. And we do need to counsel our patients. We need to have empathy with our patients who have keratoconus because oftentimes they've been through a lot. They've seen many different doctors before they get to you and having being aware of the condition and really helping them is important. But just looking at a few studies, and there are many studies out there, these are just a few, but this study does show there are decreases in the vision-related quality of life, especially with reduced vision and an increase in corneal curvature of three diopters. So, and this reduced vision-related quality of life does tend to decline over time. And this was just looking at another study contact lens wearers had better vision compared with non-contact lens wearers and improved quality of life. So those with keratoconus, you might want to fit them in contact lenses after cross-linking. But what about collaborative care? So now that you can diagnose patients, you have your tools, you have your retinoscopy looking for scissors, you're checking corneal curvature even with keratometry, you're looking for a 47, 48 or steeper, you're looking for asymmetry between the two eyes, asymmetry of astigmatism, asymmetry of myopia. And if you don't have the tools, what do you do? And that's when you can collaborate with others who do have the tools. So you can refer a patient as a suspect for keratoconus, just like we do as a suspect for glaucoma for corneal topography or tomography, like a pentacam. You can ask about the family history, that is huge. We do have genetic testing that we can do as well. We can ask about all the risk factors, including allergies and atopy and eye rubbing. We can look at those comorbidities and ethnicity. And we can work with others to do the best for our patients, which is really the most important thing to do. So we can refer to others, we can work together just like we do for many other things. And this really helps that the patient comes back to your practice 
after their cornea is stabilized with cross-linking. So the benefits of referring patients for imaging, we can prevent progression, we can give really early treatment, it is much easier to fit glasses and specialty contact lenses. And we could even say transition the patient from a more complicated to a less complicated specialty contact lens and perhaps reduce that economic burden of keratoconus. Now, there were there are multiple studies on keratoconus. I was fortunate to participate in one that showed that it's really the timing of the condition which impacts the patient's life because a patient can be going about life just normally, everything's just fine. And they can be in the late teens, early 20s, or even 30s. And it really is that critical time, sometimes for development when they're developing just in general, and boom, diagnosed with keratoconus, which can change their life. So I would encourage lots of empathy. I'd also encourage you to share the National Keratoconus Foundation with your patients. This is a wonderful resource and they have brochures that you can share in your practice. There's a World Keratoconus Day. There are excellent resources, not just for ocular conditions, but the NKCF has helped some of my patients with job related issues associated with keratoconus. So a fantastic resource just as a gentle reminder that you can offer this to your patients. So to answer that question, thank you all for staying on and then I'm gonna answer your questions. Um, but believe it or not, in high school, I could jump over five feet and I did a lot of high jump. Now, those of you who know me now, like sometimes I probably can't even walk down, you know, the hall in heels uh, straight and I always have my flats and my flip flops on too. But yeah, believe it or not, uh, years ago, I, I could jump pretty high. So I do want to thank you uh, for your time, for your attention. I'm incredibly impressed with how many of you stayed on this whole time. And with that, uh, I will close out this session. I want to be respectful to everybody's time. And thank you so much again, Dr. Barnett, for, for joining us. And we hope to see you on a next Woo You event. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Good night.